all the concerns and needs, wounds and guilt that you see upon us. But Lord, we have come to you to ask for your touch to be upon us. Welcome you, Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Forgive our speaker. His sins are many. Help us to see Christ, just Christ. Through Christ we pray. Amen. So God's dream for marriage is simple. He begins with two people of different gender. Let's call them Joe and Flo. They have much in common, equally cherished by God, joint heirs of the heavenly blessing, uniformly essential in God's plan, yet though similar, they are very starkly different. Joe is a male by nature. He provides and protects. Flo, a female, excels in nurturing and comforting. In God's plan, these two complement each other. They attract each other. They complete each other. Her femininity, her, her sensitivity, her softness, her shapeliness, that widens the eyes of Joe. His masculinity, his strength, his kindness, his confidence, his leadership, that turns her head. So when Joe meets Flo and Flo meets Joe, something deep stirs within the two of them, and they know they'll be better together than apart. So the two make a covenant to live with each other and to live for each other. Flo will have eyes for Joe. She will forget Roe and Mo and -and so-and-so. Joe is her guy, and Joe resolves identical devotion. Running to and fro will be no mo. <laughs> he has flow. He knows where to go. I thought that was clever. <laughs> so Joe and Flo covenant to become one person, and when they do, their maker smiles. This was his plan. God made them different. Male and female, he created them. So the gravitational tug between the two was God-inspired. Adam did not drool when he saw the elephant or the giraffe, but one glimpse of Eve, and he placed his hand over his rib-depleted side. And he declared, at last, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. And she will be called woman because she was taken from man. And as God brought Adam and Eve together, so he continues to bring Joes and flows together. Therefore, a man leaves his father and mother and embraces his wife. They become one flesh, the two of them. Man and wife, they were naked, but they felt no shame. So here's the blueprint in the early pages of Scripture. This is the pattern. This is the plan. This is the promise, and this is the purpose. God envisions a man and woman coming together, naked but no shame, vulnerable and fearless. They had nothing from each other physically or emotionally. They enjoy total trust. And in time, they become one flesh. That's how the text reads. It does not say they became one flesh. It's not an overnight venture, not even a honeymoon night venture. But there is a becoming of one flesh as they continue to grow And this is fostered spiritually as they give worship together, emotionally as they give strength to each other, and sexually as they give their bodies to each other. Sex is a part of God's plan for a healthy marriage. Sex is not the secret for a happy home, nor is sex absent from God's plan for a fortified family. Sex is a delightful, strategic, and sometimes frustrating element in God's plan. It was his idea. So if it's true that the church doesn't talk much about sex, then we are the only ones who don't. 
Can you make it through a movie, through a novel, through a night of television watching without sexual suggestions and innuendos? Can you make it through a day at work without jokes and coarse humor? So sex deserves our attention because it has commanded the attention of our society. Even more, sex deserves our attention because for many people, it is a source of confusion, conflict, and sometimes a source of deep hurt and wound. It doesn't have to be. I'm thinking that there is a verse in the book of Hebrews that provides us a simple strategy from God to make sex sacred and healthy in our homes. Honor marriage and guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy between wife and husband. God draws a firm line against casual and illicit sex. Two lines headline God's plan for sexual intimacy. First, honor marriage, and then second, guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy. Honor the plan and protect the privilege. Two points for an outline. Number one, honor the plan of marriage. Again, the plan, therefore a man leaves his father and mother, and he embraces his wife. They become one flesh. The two of them, the man and his wife, were naked, but they felt no shame. So the relationship begins with the leaving. A man leaves his father and mother, suggested a woman would do the same. They leave behind their formal support system. They disable the ejection seat. They burn the bridge to mama's house. They cut the umbilical cord, and they come together before God, before others. It's a public declaration. They come together. The leaving is called dating and courting, getting to know one another, sharing personality and ideas. But the naked and not ashamed doesn't come until after the formal covenant or the marriage. Now, According to God's plan, sexual intimacy is simply not a part of the dating phase. I know the movies tell you it is. I know every book you read says it is. I know every locker room chit-chat says it is. But God is pro-pre-sexual marriage. And he is against premarital sex. And there is a reason for this. My friend Jimmy Evans has been a marriage and family therapist for 35 years. His research led him to write, people who live together before marriage experience more abuse, more infidelity, more breakups, more disappointment, more problems in every category than people who do not cohabit before marriage. A couple that lives together before getting married is 50% more likely to divorce after marriage than the couple who did not. It's easy to understand why. Courtship sex stunts healthy relational growth. Courtship sex stunts healthy relational growth. It shifts the attention away from the study of the soul and the personality to a fascination with the body. Necessary friendship creation is neglected. Essential communication tools go underdeveloped. And most of all, spiritual intimacy takes a backseat to physical intimacy. The purpose of courting or dating, even engagement, is to come to know each other's souls, not bodies. Sex, rightly positioned after the leaving and the cleaving, then becomes a delightful wedding gift that can be opened innumerable times in marriage. Here's the setting God envisions. 
two children of his make a public covenant. They leave. They disable the ejection seat. They cleave. They come together. As we've mentioned before, this is a Hebrew word for they, they glue themselves together. It's a super glue. They come together and they publicly declare before God and before others, we are each other's. They fall into each other's arms beneath the canopy of God's blessing, surrounded by the security of the promise of fidelity. Both know both will be there in the morning. Both know both are in this thing for the long haul. Both know both will be there, Lord willing, even as the strength fades and the skin wrinkles. Both give each other exclusive for your eyes only privileges. Gone is the shame. Gone is the undisciplined lust. Gone is the morning after insecurity. What remains is a celebration of permanence, a tender moment in which the body continues what was begun in the mind and the heart. A time in which the man and his wife were both naked, but they were not ashamed Can you imagine nakedness with no shame? Can you imagine sex with no guilt? God can. God envisions a pure, unadulterated, playful joy between a husband and a wife who have covenanted, who have pledged themselves, who have locked themselves into a relationship. This is God's picture. His first command, the first command of the Bible is to have sex. Does that surprise you? Don't look at me like a preacher can't say that. Here is the first command in the Bible. Be fruitful and increase in number. Before any other command, let that one be framed and hung in every bedroom, in every marriage. God commands sex. When he saw everything he had made, he said, it is good. When he saw the sand on the beach, when he saw the sunset on the horizon, he said, it is good. And when he saw the body of Adam and the body of Eve, when he saw the attraction each had for the other, when he saw the affection, when he saw the desire, when he saw the touch, when he saw the arousal, when he saw the kiss, He said, that's good. What does this say about God? Oh, how we tend to assume that God is austere and grumpy. But our God is a God who loves pleasure, who creates it and blesses it. We see this in the life of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, whose first miracle was what? To turn water into wine. Can you envision God with a smile on his face and a glass of wine in his hand? Such is the image of God in the Bible. The Bible says that God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. This must include sex. Sex is about procreation, but it's also about recreation. Turns out the first command to be fruitful and multiply is a fun one to obey. No one appreciates the gift of sex as much as God's children do. This isn't just my opinion. America was shocked when USA Today ran an article which said, several major research studies show that church ladies and the men who sleep with them are among the most sexually satisfied people on the face of the earth. Several years ago, the results of the most comprehensive and methodologically sound sex survey ever conducted was released, and the University of Chicago reported that religious women experienced significantly higher levels of sexual satisfaction than non-religious women. I'm thinking this article would be an effective evangelism tool. So marital sex, according to God's plan, is a gift, a delightful, enjoyable gift that is a part of the coming together of two human beings. 
beings. It is a gift that is sacred. Consequently, we honor the plan. First the leaving, then the cleaving, and then the man and woman were naked with no shame. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes Johnny pushing the baby carriage. So we honor the plan. Then we protect the privilege. The big point is the obvious one. God regards marital sex as something that is holy, that is sacred, a gift that is unique. It is set apart for a special purpose. It's not a dirty secret to be swept under the rug. It's not a duty to be reluctantly obeyed. It is simply a gift from God to strengthen a marriage. How can this gift strengthen your marriage? Well, here's a few ways. First, consecrate your sex life to God. Consider your marriage bed a holy place. Kneel beside it and say, God, may what happens in this bed bring honor to you and joy to my mate. Ask God for wisdom and understanding. Invite him to bring healing into your life. I'm very aware that this has been for many people a source of pain. Perhaps you were inappropriately touched or you've been taken advantage of or perhaps you have many regrets. The Lord's ability to heal goes deep, dear child of God. Let him heal you. And God's grace is sufficient. Let him forgive you. He's ready to write a new chapter in this part of your life. Talk to him. Also, communicate with your spouse. Speak to one another. Discuss concerns. Express frustrations. There are times when one spouse or the other simply isn't there. There are occasions when interest levels don't meet. One is more enthused than the other. Talk it through. Don't make your spouse feel guilty or manipulated. Just let the servant spirit reign. And keep courting. If there was more courting in marriage, there would be fewer marriages in court. (laughs) What you did to fall in love, keep doing so you'll stay in love. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love. And put your spouse's desires above your own. Take a servant spirit into your sex life. Marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. Marriage is a decision to serve the other, whether in bed or not. So see the marriage bed as a place for you to honor one of God's children rather than satisfy your desires. And this happens as you accept sexual differences. Men and women are different. We love that. Men and women are different. We hate that. (laughs) Love or hate the differences, they're there. So we're wise to understand them. You husbands should live with your wives in an understanding way. And wives, understand and support your husbands in ways that show your support for Christ. For example, ladies, your husbands see sex as a primary need. Men, your wives see sex as optional. When men were asked to rank the importance of sex, they continually, constantly, I'm sorry, they consistently Scored it one, two, or three. I think some scored it one, two, and three. (laughs) Women, on the average, ranked sex in the number 13 slot. (laughs) Right behind gardening together. (laughs) Apparently, the presence of a good garden indicates a restless husband. Men and women are different. 
both can understand the other. It takes wisdom to have a good family. It takes understanding to make it strong. Here's an example. Men, we need to understand that women today indwell a beauty pageant world. Everything they see tells them that they are as valuable as their waistline is thin or figure is curvy. Our Victoria's Secret Society measures a woman in the way she looks. She needs somebody, she needs a husband who will treasure her for who she is, and that is a daughter of God. And she needs to hear on a regular basis, I love you. I'd marry you again if given the chance. And she needs to hear that other than times of romance. Women, it would help you to understand that your husbands live in a Las Vegas light show when it comes to sexual stimuli. It's everywhere. Billboards, commercials, telling him not to think so much about sex is like telling him to ignore donuts in a Krispy Kreme shop. (laughs) Everywhere. Why, companies use curvy models to sell bass boats. Just be patient. Pray for him. Most of all, let's serve one another. Honor marriage. Honor it and guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy. If you do, you might enjoy a marriage like the one described in the Ann Landers column. Someone wrote Ann Landers and said, Dear Ann, last weekend my parents celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. This morning they left on a long awaited trip to Hawaii. They were as excited as if they were on their honeymoon. When my parents married, they only had enough money for a three-day trip 50 miles from home. They made a pact then that each time they made love, they would put a dollar in a special metal box and save it (laughs) for a honeymoon in Hawaii for their 50th anniversary. Dad was a policeman. Mother was a schoolteacher. They lived in a modest house and did all their own repairs. Raising five children was a challenge, and sometimes money was short. But no matter what emergency came up, Dad would not let Mom take any money out of the Hawaii account. (laughs) As the amount grew, they put it in a savings account and then bought CDs. My parents were very much in love. I can remember Dad coming home and telling Mom, I have a dollar in my pocket. (laughs) She would smile at him and reply, I know just how to spend it. (laughs) When each of us married, mom and dad gave us a small metal box and told us their secret which we found inspiring. Mom and dad never told us how much money they managed to save. (laughs) But it must have been considerable because when they cashed in those CDs, they had enough for airfare to Hawaii plus hotel accommodations for 10 days and plenty of spending money. Before they boarded the plane, dad winked at me and said, tonight we are starting an account for Cancun. I thought you'd enjoy this story about 50 great years of intimacy in marriage from a loving daughter in Abilene, Texas. Today, whether you are single or married, whether you're a teenager or a grandparent, could I call upon you to submit yourself to God's plan? For some of you, this is the most difficult decision of discipleship. Perhaps you are involved in an inappropriate relationship. 
And God is calling you to discontinue it and to honor his plan. Perhaps you're living with unbearable guilt and God is calling you to give it to him and receive his forgiveness. Perhaps you have been wounded or afflicted in this area, perhaps by your choice or perhaps by the inappropriate behavior of someone else. Would you allow God to step into this part of your life that perhaps you've kept closeted away and allow him to speak words of grace and healing into your life? And perhaps this is the part of your marriage that needs love and needs attention. Receive it. Invite God. Communicate with each other. And allow the Lord to give you a new season. It's his will. For he loves you. He made you. Most heavenly Father, our King and our Master, we bow before you inviting that you now would please step into every element, every part of our lives, especially this one that we have discussed today. We pray, Heavenly Father, that those who are single may be strong and assured. Uh, Those who are married may be blessed and instructed. Those who have stumbled may find grace. Those who have been wounded may find healing. We beg you, Almighty God, to step into this part of our world Help us to hear your voice and your voice only and to trust you.